Today I'm going to talk about Project Fugu and how the web is going to reach parity with native. So I'm a browser engineer. I've been that since around 2006. I've worked on WebKit at Nokia, and then I moved to, uh, to Intel, also worked a bit of WebKit, and then later moved to work on Chromium and Blink. Uh, I also mostly now work on standards, so like bringing the web to the next level uh, and be prepared for the future. So this is both on like actual web standards or, as well as JavaScript. As part of this, I got elected into the technical architecture group at the W3C, uh, where we try to like, make sure that all these new standards are aligned so we have one cohesive uh, platform. So I guess my, the, the sh uh, to sum up, like, my work on the web is that I basically love the web, and I've been there since the beginning. It's what got me excited about computers. So hey, why is the web so great? Well, I think the web is really great because it has a great reach. Basically, everyone has a browser. A browser can run on all kinds of different devices, even in the car, or even maybe on your fridge. There's very low friction. Fridge, uh, friction. It's like basically you just type in the URL, and there you are. You don't have to wait half an hour to install an app or, or and all of that. It's also safe. We try. We do a lot of work on keeping the web safe, so that when you just type in one of those URLs or click on it, at least if you don't download like native apps, you should be safe. Uh, what's also pretty cool is that you can compose web. So you can have an article talking about some crazy things happening in politics, and there can be like a tweet from a president in there that is being composed from a different side. So you can compose technology as well. If you don't use a web page for a long time, it goes away, it removes from your caches, so it's kind of like ephemeral, which is unlike when I go abroad, and if they force me to install a native app, I forget to remove it, so it keeps updating in the background, and three years later, it's still there on my phone, taking up space. That is not the case with the web. Um, it's also deep linkable. It means that I can get a link, for instance, to a tweet, or, and I can send that to my mom, and she can click on it and see exactly that tweet. It's not something like, please download Twitter and then search for that tweet, and you'll never find it, uh, which sometimes happens to other platforms. So everything basically starts from the URL. If you have been at any web conference the last couple of years, you've probably heard about these things called PWA, or Progressive Web Apps. Uh, so these are um, basically uh, web apps that uh, can work offline, that uh, should have good performance, and should be responsive. So basically, uh, web apps, uh, the web is a place, uh, great place to be. It has this worldwide reach. It works across all kind of different architectures, operating system, and form factors. There's even people running on, on the smart, smart watches. It also has a lot of a big open source ecosystem around it, for instance, with MPN libraries and the like. And it has a lot of APIs. You can do a lot of things on the web today, probably a much more than you, you think you could. It's also flexible. You can use the web for writing news articles, games, applications, books, and the like. And you can make those fast. You can also make them slow, but it is possible to make them fast. So uh, even progressive web apps is coming to desktop browsers. So here we have a picture of Chrome. And uh, you probably notice there's this small install thing on the top. If I click there, uh, this is a progressive web app. It has done all the right things. You can actually install it and suddenly it just looks like any native app. So that is pretty amazing, right? So actually, we have all kinds of things you can do on the web today. So this is just like a small set of like cool APIs available to you, the web developers. But sometimes you do need a bit more power, uh, like He-Man here. And for this, we have something called WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is this like portable size and low time efficient format suitable for compilation to the web. Uh, it's kind of like a bytecode, uh, low level. Uh, so you take, for instance, your existing C++ code, you can compile it and run it on the web in the browser. So for instance, uh, this company called Autodesk, they have this application called AutoCAD. Uh, this is something they started working on around, like, I think it was 35 years, at least 30 years ago. And they just took like, the existing code, they cleaned it up a bit, and they, they had this one view, this basically a canvas, uh, where they, they're basically just running all the old existing code using WebAssembly. And then they build up the UI around it using, they use React, but like web technology. And, and now you can basically open like 90% of all AutoCAD files in your web browser. And they're working on bringing like the last 10% as well. These are 3D files, so that requires a bit more APIs, uh, but that is coming. 
So you can say that WebAssembly really solves a lot of like tough questions, especially with like legacy and, ex and taking this existing code. But sometimes you're still lacking some capabilities. You might not be able to create that application you want to create with those APIs available to the web. And hence, we get the set Panda. So for instance, if I have this very cool application, I might not want to have all my files on this special like online drive by Autodesk or by Google Drive or something else. Maybe I just want them local. Maybe that's how I work. Maybe I don't really want to share them. So can I add, like, work with like, local files? So these are one of the gaps that we are trying to bridge. So this is the project Fugu. The Fugu is actually is a project that is started by Google and then joined by Intel, by my team, and by Microsoft. So Fugu, if you don't know, is a Japanese word. It's apparently pronounced like Hugu or Hugu. Uh, it's a pufferfish. Uh, it's very cute. Apparently, you can also eat it. I've actually tasted it. It's pretty good, actually. But it's actually dangerous. Uh, that fish is poisonous. So if you don't prepare this dish well, and have taken the right education and, and studied for many years, well, then you might actually get people killed. So you can kind of say it's delicious if it's prepared correctly, deadly if not. So this is kind of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to add additional capabilities to the web uh, so it gets like to the same level as native apps. But we want to do it in a way that we like still like maintain the core tenets of the web, like privacy, trust, and user security. <coughs> if we don't do this right, well, then we get the deadly fish. So. That's hence the name. So uh, Google have this site called Powerful APIs where you can read a bit about the project. Um, you can also just go to the Chromium bug tracker, and you can see that all the things that we're currently working on. So the process we're using, because a lot of people ask this question, they say like, well, I've heard that with people doing like a new web API, it might take like four, five, six years before it's a thing and it's implemented. So how do we do this? How do we make sure that we can get these new features to you developers as soon as possible? The first thing we do is to actually identify needs and create use cases. Well, not create use cases, but at least like write down the actual use cases. So there's people actually going and talking to like internal customers, like maybe at Intel, maybe at Google, but also to external partners like Autodesk or Figma, and ask like, why don't you build for the web? Then we try to prioritize these and come with these use cases. Then we write a document called an explainer. I'm actually linking to a document here called the explainer explainer. That's what we call it. That explains you how to write an explainer. It's a very nice name. Uh, after having done that, we, we try to iterate with the community, with different browsers, uh, and try to get like feedback and, and iterate on our ideas. Maybe the, some of the ideas that we had, we figured out like this is not what we should do. And we try to add those to the explainers, so like, well, we kind of thought about this solution. This is the reason why we're not doing it this way. Uh, then we start like, actually writing the spec and, getting, and, and try to like, do some implementation work so people can try it and work with it. And at some point, uh, it's good enough that developers can actually get their hands dirty and actually try it out. For this, we have something, a pro uh, process called origin trial. So you might know that www.google.com is an origin uh, in the sense of the web. So this means that if you want to use this new feature on your website before it's available, before it's shipping in browsers, you can go to this website called Origin Trial, and you can say, please give me a key. With this key inside your website, you can actually access this API for this like beta period. So maybe after the next Chrome release, you will need a new key because like, the API changed, and you need to, of course, to understand that this is not set in stone. We're trying to improve this API. Then at the end, if everything works out and we think this is still a good idea, we'll actually ship it, and it will be uh, widely available. Uh, at least this is from the Chrome point of view, and we, of course, try to make sure that other browsers are interested and listen to the feedback so that we hopefully get these APIs on all browsers. So you might be interested in hearing, like, what are all those cool new capabilities that you're working on? Well, one of the things that we already have shipped, and this was actually before we created the process, but it was kind of like really related, is Bluetooth and USB uh, connectivity on the web. So sometimes you, you buy this toy, and maybe you don't want this, this native app, or maybe you're even afraid that maybe this native app won't be working in five years. But it would be nice if I could just like, create this web app, and I can even like, create my own. Um, so for this, we, we added, added APIs for both connecting to Bluetooth, like the new Bluetooth called Bluetooth Low Energy, as well as USB. 
Uh, and I've actually personally used that for some projects, uh, and it's pretty amazing. It's actually really amazing how easy it gets to write these kind of drivers to talk to these devices in comparison with writing it in what people usually do in something like C or C++. So here's an example of someone creating this like Lego Batmobile and actually just controlling that uh, from a web page. I find that really amazing. So actually, if you want to, I don't have the time to talk about web USB and web Bluetooth, uh, but I have a talk here. So if you're interested in the future, I will share these slides online later. You can actually go and watch that talk and know all you want to know about web Bluetooth and web USB. So this is shipping in Chrome today. Sometimes, with, uh, though with these APIs, uh, the OSs uh, kind of like steal some of the devices. It's called, they, it claims the devices. So for instance, if you plug in a USB keyboard, like you cannot talk to that from the web because your OS like Windows or Chrome or Chrome OS or Mac will say, hey, no, that's a keyboard, it's mine. And they will claim it. But it actually happens to be that a lot of companies, they actually reuse some of these APIs that would, so something like HID, which is Human Interface Definition Devices as a mouse and keyboard. A lot of companies have actually reused these APIs for other things like barcode scanner. So in order to actually be able to talk to these and claim these devices, we are adding support for web HID as well as serial devices. So serial devices is also something that usually could use web USB, but a lot of people don't have access to actually change the firmware on these devices. Hence, we have to use this web serial API instead. So for instance, this could be really useful for like education where you want to like program some of these Arduino boards. I have actually programmed some of these myself. So here's a small like example of how easy this could be. So this is, I'm just like requesting a device. Uh, I'm setting a port and then I get like a reader and then from there on I can just get data. Very, very simple. So this is something that's coming very soon. It's, it's very soon entering in an origin trial. Web ID is the same. Uh, especially a lot of people want this for game pads or like the barcode scanners. Very important for a lot of companies. So this is also very, very interesting. Also coming soon. Sometimes on the web, or like the web is all about URL, so sharing is very, very important. Uh, but sometimes it's annoying that you have to go in into the app and actually get the URL and share it, especially if it's installed as a progressive web app, because you might not have that Chrome around your app, because it's more like an app uh, UI. So in that case, we have made a new API called WebShare. This is already shipping in Chrome and even on Safari, that allows you to actually share something to the installed app on your phone or maybe computer, uh, even progressive web apps that are installed. So for instance, here I have Twitter as a progressive web app for my, in, on my phone. So very simple API. You can currently only share title and URL, very simple. We're working on adding uh, additional feedback in version two, so you can also share files, uh, which is very important. The other end of the thing is that what if I have this progressive web app, like Twitter, and I want people to share things into my app. Like I go to Google Photos, or, and I click on a picture and I say, please share this to Twitter because I want to tweet it. Uh, this is also possible. This is by uh, something called um, Web share target. Um, you basically take the web app manifest, which is part of any progressive web app, and you extend it with share target. Uh, it gets a special URL for the action. It just works like form submission. And here you'll then be able to share things into apps. This actually works on Twitter, the progressive web app today. Uh, so this is already shipping, uh, but the next version coming with file support, which is really the interesting part if you, for instance, want to share an image, is work in progress and is also shipping very soon. Another thing that people have really liked uh, is like if you have these apps like video players or music players, it would be nice to have access to like these cards where you can actually control it while it's not totally visible, maybe in, in the background, uh, it's still open. Uh, so we also have an API for that. This even works on, on, on people with these like actually hardware keys. Uh, very, very simple API where you just access like media session and you set these action handlers and then you can, you will, these UIs will show up and you can interact with it when people click on them. So this is also already shipping. Something else, like I talked about the barcode code scanner, it's very important for a lot of companies that love QR codes. Uh, it's very cheap, you can print them. Uh, 
and you can use it for things like tracking your inventory. So it would be really nice that you can just like detect this from the web without having to rely on big and slow uh, libraries. So a lot of actually phones, they support this, either in hardware or very highly optimized software stacks. Uh, so we're adding shape detection API as well. Um, this API itself actually works on both scanning faces, uh, barcodes, and text, but we are currently uh, shipping, going to ship the one that is for barcodes, because that's what most people are interested in. <coughs> Very simple API. If it's available, you create a, for instance, a barcode detector. You give it an image. If it's a video, you have to give it every frame. Uh, and it will give you code back, so that would be kind of like a a dictionary that will show you like where it was so you can draw on top of it. For instance, well, this is where I detected it. Uh, plus, of course, like the barcode will give you the number as well. So this is also uh, very soon coming to Chrome. Something else that a lot of people ask for is for when you have this progressive web app, would it be nice to get these uh, <coughs> small dots on top of the icon? Like if ah, there's an unread uh, message, on some platforms, you can actually write maybe a text, like a number. On others, you can only write a dot. Uh, so the API allows you to do both. Of course, if a platform only supports a dot, then you'll just get a dot. So this is also being implemented and soon shipping in Chrome. Um, so this is currently in an origin trial. When we talk to people, especially in third world countries, uh, such as India, like, why are you not doing like web apps? Why are you doing native apps? They always came back and said, well, I need access to contacts. Like people here, <coughs> you're trying to create like a social app, or, or you want to share to your friends. Is we need these access to contacts, and we're like, yeah, but that's really dangerous because like <coughs> people can start like spamming your friends, uh, and that's yeah. How do we do that? So we spend a lot of time on coming up with this nice solution where the users in control. <coughs> you will see the contacts. Uh, available. These are not sure shared with the application at that point. You can select uh, <coughs> the, the contact you want to share with the app. You can even decide whether, the one to, whether you want to share like the phone number, email, or none of the two. Uh, the app itself will ask you uh, what it would like to have. Like, I would like to have name, email, and telephone number, but I only want one. You see, multiply, uh, or you can say multiply true if you want multiply. And then you just like call navigate.contact.select. It returns a promise because it might take a while before people click on all those contacts. And when you get back, if for instance, if I clicked on myself, I would just get like this array of JSON objects back. Very simple API uh, that a lot of people have been requested. So this is also coming uh, soon to Chrome. And you can actually, it's behind a flag today, so you can actually try it out yourself. Um, when we also looked at Project Fugu, we talked to a lot of uh, people using Electron, because you probably notice on desktop that more and more applications are web-based, but they're wrapped in Electron. So these are apps like Figma, um, Slack, and the like. So we're trying to ask them, what do you really need on the web? And what we heard from a lot of, especially this design app, is that people need access to fonts. You don't have access to all the fonts on your phone and, and on the web, it's also because it's kind of fingerprinting, uh, so it's kind of like you can use it for tracking people. But maybe if you have this like design tool installed, you might want to share funds with that app only. And even for companies like I work at Intel, of course we have an Intel font, so it would be nice to use Intel font on your slides, but so it would be nice if I could just access that maybe from Google Slides. So we're working on this fund access API where you, with certain applications, can share additional funds that you have available on your machine. Also, very, very simple API. Uh, this is still uh, early days, and we're talking to people working on funds and, and these companies as Figma to find the best way to approach this problem. But now we're talking about one of those things that really interests me myself. If you really want to create like a real native app, like fund access, like, like file access is really important. Think about using something like Visual Studio Code. It was actually based on web technology. Like you really need access to local funds. But as, as well, this is also very dangerous, so really had to get this right. So we are now working on the native file system API, where you can actually share one file or directory uh, with an app. The idea is that you share them per session. So if you reload the app or close it, well, then you don't have access any longer. 
but we are exploring ideas around, uh, like for instance, if you install this app as a progressive web app, something that you want to use many times, then that app should have the ability to take the file or directory handle and actually serialize it and store it in a database, like an index DB. So next time you open up like Visual Studio Code, it will still have access to those files. Of course, you as a user should be able to revoke it at any point. Um, so uh, while doing this, we made sure that we improved the API to use all modern web technologies, such so as uh, using uh, promises, everything returns a promise, uh, integrating well with streams and the like. So this is also coming soon. Uh, we're rolling out like feature per feature because actually file system is actually uh, three things, uh, maybe it's more things, at least there's access to your local files. Then there's the whole like web share target or share web share where you share a file between apps. Um, and then there's file handlers. For instance, if you go into your file uh, manager and click on a, maybe a dot DOC file, a PDF, uh, PDF file, you want it to open an app. So how can you register that you are one of those apps that can handle these files or MIME types? So we're working on these things and rolling it out feature by feature, making sure that we do it the right way and making sure that it's secure. So I come from Intel, so I of course need to explain, talk a little bit about what we've been working on at Intel, because why are we working on Fugu? So one of the first things we did uh, was working on generic sensors. So this is shipping in uh, Chrome today, and has been for a while. Um, we looked, it was basically because we were looking at all the, the pain points that developers had using something like devo device motion, device orientation on the web. Uh, for instance, there's difference between the values on iOS and Chrome and Android, so you need to know what platform you're on to like modify them <laughs> to get the right result. Uh, you could not configure them. For instance, you m maybe you don't want like 50, uh, 50 values per second. Uh, maybe you just want 10. So why, why waste battery if you don't need it? Uh, all kinds of different issues we found with these uh, existing APIs. So we tried to like work together on creating a new API that solved all of them. And we ended up shipping accelerometer, gyroscope, linear acceleration sensor, absolute orientation sensor, and relative orientation sensor in Chrome. We also have implemented ambient light sensor and magnetometer, and we're currently working on shipping these as well, but going through like all the security problem because something like some of these can actually be abused to figure out like what password you're, you're typing in. So we need, need to make sure that this is all these attack vectors are not possible with these APIs. Something by limiting the, the frequency and the like. So this is kind of like how you can see these API, how they, they relate to each other, because some of them are actually what's called a derived sensor. Like a linear acceleration sensor is actually derived from the data you get from an accelerometer. So you could do that yourself, of course, doing that in, in C++ is faster and more efficient than doing JavaScript. Uh, orientation sensor, you have an like absolute and relative. Uh, that is whether it's using the magnetometer or not. So whether your start is relative to the uh, magnetic north or not. So uh, actually, because this uh, only works in Chrome, I actually went ahead and created a polyfill uh, that works on top of the existing API so that people that want to use this in the, uh, production and need to use to make something work on, for instance, iOS can just use these polyfills and use the exact same API. So here's one example I thought was very interesting is that now we, I made this demo on the phone where you could kind of like test out uh, all these sensors and I thought like, yeah, we have this thing called Web Bluetooth. So if I use Web Bluetooth, uh, maybe I can just like emulate these APIs because they're so simple and I just did that and suddenly I could connect with this IoT device. I just thought like, well, it just like shows you how far along the web has come. So currently we're working on, uh, my co-worker Rejo is working on shipping uh, the ambient light sensor. Um, because of the privacy mitigation, we had to lower the frequency to 10 hertz, and we're actually decreasing the precision a bit to the nearest 50 lux, which is actually very precise still. Uh, so here's an example actually showing this, like it, it, it in use with a map, for instance, you drive through a tunnel, uh, and it gets dark, and it should change the color. It also shows that it already works on the new Chromium-based Edge browser on Windows. So actually, sensors are really, really interesting, and there's a lot to, to learn. So I have another presentation uh, you might want to check out if you want to learn all the nitty-gritty details about sensors. Uh, 
Something else we've been working on uh, since a while actually, but has been on hold, is uh, something called NFC, stands for Near Field Communication. Uh, you probably have seen that those tags where you put up your phone and you can click on and it can do something or read the data. It's also what is being used for like Google Pay and Apple Pay. So we thought it would be really nice to expose this to web developers. Um, so we have uh, worked on, currently we worked on uh, something called NDEF. It stands for the NFC Data Exchange Format. Uh, it's kind of like there are different tags in NFC with different uh, protocols, like lower level protocols. But this is like a protocol that sits on top of them. Uh, so this is like the most useful one. Uh, so for instance, I made this small demo uh, where you can actually make a shopping list and you could place this around the kitchen. So if you're out of milk, you just like tap your phone and it will get added to your shopping list. Uh, so you make sure to buy milk next time at the grocery store. Um, so I even uh, showcased it uh, to the inventor of the web once and he was excited. So that made me really, really happy. <laughs> So here's a small example of the demo. It was supposed to be playing. Maybe it's not playing. That is, that's probably something we can fix. Just a second. I have this very nice mouse, and there we go. So you see my demo here. Uh, I'm having a small grocery list. You can see I can tick off uh, items. Uh, then you say all done, or you can re-add them. If you don't want them, you can also just swipe them away. Very nice, implemented progressive web app. Uh, this is actually, now I'm adding a few items manually. This is actually based on lit element that Justin was showcasing earlier today. So I can also uh, take this thing saying write to NFC tag instead. So now I'm writing, remember to buy NFC tags. Then I, it asked me to actually touch one of the NFC tags, so I do that, I will write it. So if I touch these again, you'll see they will be added. So now I'm touching the right one, and so it got added to my shopping list. So this like shows you some of those things that you could, one of those examples, what you could do with NFC. Uh, so now I'm just removing all of them, uh, just to, to showcase here that I can add like items. I think it was pretty nice. Uh, the API is uh, supposed to be really simple. I would say, having looked at all the native APIs, I, am, uh, I understand why a lot of people don't use NFC. They are not very friendly, uh, but we've been trying to really make it easy uh, to work with. So you basically have a reader and a writer. Uh, you can read events, you get records back, and then you, you can act on them. Uh, here I'm showing an example of, like, I'm just writing two records, so I'm just using, like, def defining everything using JSON, very JavaScript-like, very, very easy. So this is, uh, we are currently working on finalizing the API, making sure that you can do everything with this API that you can with native APIs. Uh, and uh, then we want to, I think the next version of Chrome uh, coming up, it should enter or in trial if we don't have some major issues showing up. Something else I have been personally working on is keeping the screen alive. You can imagine like, me standing here and presenting this, and suddenly this happens. My computer decides to sleep. Uh, so, for this not to happen, we have something called a wake lock. So it's a lock that uh, makes sure that something doesn't go to sleep. Um, this could be the screen, or it could be the, actually the CPU, maybe even the Wi-Fi connection. Uh, so there are like multiply, we're currently working with two different locks, uh, screen and system. One for the screen, obviously, uh, display, or uh, one for like the CPU. For instance, if you want to maybe rotate an image or do something uh, before the screen, uh, the computer falls asleep, or the phone. Um, very simple. Uh, you're, here I'm showing one example where I request the screen lock, and uh, after 10 minutes, I just release it again. And then like my screen can fall asleep if it wants to. So this is coming very soon. It should enter order and trial as well in the next uh, Chrome release. Uh, and hopefully then be used by applications such as Google Slides. We've also been working a lot on media, uh, especially like this camera thing. It's really nice that you can actually control things on the web as well. You, you really want to enable people to be able to write something like Instagram on the web. So you don't always have to use native. Uh, so then, so we've been working a lot of exposing these features on the web, and as you can see, <coughs> you can do a lot of things today. 
uh, even working together with other libraries as OpenCV, and you can create all these funny effects, like funny hats. Um, here's other examples. Uh, we've been working on uh, like uh, professional cameras, especially for meeting rooms. Uh, some of these have the ability to zoom, to pan or tilt. Uh, that's really nice if you're doing like video conferencing. So why shouldn't you be able to do that on something like Hangouts? Uh, so we have been adding that to Chrome as well. Um, this is called Media Stream Image Capture, and this is, uh, most of this is already in Chrome. At Intel, we also have a camera called RealSense. Uh, it sets apart from other cameras, and I guess we'll see more and more of these cameras in the future, is that it actually has a depth uh, sensor. So it can sense how far away something is. So here you can see Redo, he is like changing the background depending on the distance. I say like, let me just replace my background uh, with uh, some nice looking jungle uh, and not the boring Intel office. Uh, this looks much nicer, right? Other things you can do is that you can actually do the interactions like this. This is done by another coworker of mine. He's actually playing around with WebGL and seeing like uh, what data you can use with a depth sensing camera. And uh, yeah, it's another example here where he's trying to actually pick up uh, one of these boxes and put it on top of the other one. Maybe it doesn't look so good, but at least it's very nice uh, for a demo. <laughs> so yeah, this is also something we're working on and that should be coming soon to Chrome. Of course, it requires you to have one of these cameras, but these are becoming more and more uh, uh, common. So if you look at all these APIs we started out with, like there's a lot of things you do on the web, but very soon you can do so much more if we have success with our product, which of course we are intending on. If you want to learn about origin trials, uh, go to developers.chrome.com slash origin trials. Uh, he can also sign up for existing origin trials. Um, if you have an idea that wasn't mentioned here, you think you we definitely should do that, this is why you can't do your business, Please go and report a new Fugu request in the Chrome Tracker. Just go to bit.ly slash new Fugu request, and uh, we'll try to see uh, if we can make that happen. Here's a tentative uh, launch schedule. This was actually shown in Google I.O., more or less like when we expect to ship things. I think we're around M77 now. Uh, and actually, you can go to another site. I don't, I don't have the URL here, but this is actually goo.gle, like Google slash uh, uh, fugu dash api dash tracker and you'll get this this tracker where you can actually see everything you're working on um, the current chrome version when you see uh, a fish it's shipping in chrome <coughs> and when it's green is when we intend to have it uh, run as an origin trial so you can see this priority one this is what's most important that most people are working on and then you have like priority two, and then like priority three, there's like really no one working on it currently, but we would like to do that at some point. Here are a few resources you can check out if you want to learn more about Project Fugu. Otherwise, I will share my slides later. And with that, I want to say thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you learned something and got excited about where the web is heading. Thank you.